to the 43rd Ryder Cup here at Whistling Straits. We are joined by Justin Thomas. Justin, welcome to your second Ryder Cup, uh, first here in the United States. Um, let's go back three years to Paris. You had a terrific record. Um, but what did you learn or experience there that you weren't counting on? Uh, at that point, you were a rookie. But what, what happened, might have happened there that surprised you about being part of a Ryder Cup team? Uh, probably, I mean, I knew it was going to be a special week and we we're all going to be together as a team, but just the brotherhood, the camaraderie, it's, uh, I mean, the, the, the moments and time spent in that team room, it, it's hard to explain. It's, um, you know, even nights like last night, just all getting together, you know, you'd think that all of us are, are best friends the entire year. We hang out, we all live in the same place and it's just, um, it's just a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's great for all the the girlfriends and wives to catch up and it's great for all the players especially you know with tour championship being a couple of weeks ago being able to catch up from what they've been doing the last couple of weeks what they uh what they've been up to so i don't know i mean france was obviously the outcome was not any anything like we wanted but um i'm sure everybody even the the guys that had been there i mean it's just like we play a stroke play tournament. You hope to learn from any experience you have. And, um, and you know, I felt like I tried to learn from how to handle my emotions and, and, and adrenaline and everything like that. That will hopefully be uh, helpful this week. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's start right here at number eight. Go ahead, sir. Hey, Justin. Um, you're an obvious candidate to be one of the playing leaders on Team USA because of your experience and your success. I'm curious if you agree with that, if you feel like that's a responsibility you have. And if yes, what does that mean to you? What kind of things do you do as a leader? I mean, my experience uh, isn't really uh, there. I mean, I've only played one Ryder Cup. I mean, I've been fortunate to, you know, play in a lot of events and, and have some success in the individual events I played. But in terms of a Ryder Cup, I mean, this is my first one in the States. Um, you know, I'm looking to the captains. I'm looking to, you know, Jordan, Brooks, DJ, the guys that have played um, in, in the Ryder Cup in the States, uh, if I have any questions or, or anything like that. But... I mean, my role, I'm looking at it on this team is whatever it needs to be. I mean, I will I will help the, the rookies or help the, the first-timers if they need it, if they want it. Um, I will, you know, I'm, I'm still going to be myself. I'm still going to be sarcastic. I'm still going to have fun. I'm still going to needle people. I mean, that's just who I am. And, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, my role on this team is just to try to just to be relaxed and, and go out and get a point whenever I'm uh, – whenever Strick wants me to go play. And um, – Whatever they need from me, whatever they don't need from me, you know, if I play five, if I play one, um, I'm just going to try to get as many points as I can and, and try to make the week as enjoyable as I can for everybody on the team. Thanks. Over here on your left, uh, Jeff Babino, 19. Justin, you, you've accomplished a lot of things on a lot of different stages. What, what did playing so well in Paris do for you confidence-wise? I mean, it did a lot. I would have preferred to go 0-5 and, and us win the cup, but um, it, did, it did a lot for me just to, to know that uh, – Furyk, you know, Captain Furyk had the confidence in me to, to play me that much and to put me out first in singles was um, was probably one of the, you know, the best honors that I've ever received. I mean, without him, if he doesn't know that or if he does, I mean, it just was, uh, it was really cool. And um, I don't know, I mean, I took a lot from it, but like I said, you know, it's a team event and my, what I did in France is irrelevant because we didn't get it done as a team. And like I said, I would, I'd gladly go 0-5 this week if that meant that we brought the cup back on our soil. Mark on four. Hey, Justin, um, just kind of curious from your experience in France, what do you feel like some of the secrets to success are as a rookie in this competition? Obviously you've got six here and, mm -hmm. um, you know, can that be an advantage because everybody's kind of wide-eyed and, and, and stoked, or can it be a disadvantage because you haven't experienced that first tee and that kind of thing? Well, I think when you look at, you know, your rookies are, um, you know, a two-time major champion and Colin Morikawa or a FedEx Cup champion and Patrick Cantlay and a gold medalist and Xander Shoffley, you know, it's, when you're looking at guys like that that are your rookies, um, that says a lot about your team. And I think at the end of the day, you can – dive as deep as you want into the pairings, into who's sitting, who's playing. But at the end of the day, whatever team plays the best is going to win. We have 12 unbelievable players. They have 12 unbelievable players. And it's really just who's going to go out there and get it and who's going to go out and, and execute the best. And, um, I mean, I've watched many Ryder Cups on TV, and it's, it's you know, who makes the putts, who flips those matches, who grinds out the halves, and um, and who gets it done. And I have – I mean, I'd go, go to war with these – 
these 12 or 11 other guys and, and our captains like I'm going to do this week. And, I'm, uh, you know, I have all the faith in the world and all the rookies. And, you know, I think their, their experience um, proves that they are beyond rookies. But um, it's going to be a fun week. It was a fun week for me in France just in terms of the atmosphere and experience and it all. And uh, I'm sure the fact that it's on U.S. soil will, will help those nerves a little bit. Let's go 20 and then 21 with Phil. Doug? Justin, when you said that, that last night you would have thought you guys were all best friends, I guess the question is, are you all best friends? And, and why is it important that you at least feel that way? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I don't know. It just it, it feels not that we aren't friends off the course. It's just um, it's just different. You know, it's, it's you're never not that we're forced to be in the same room, but it's like we're obviously all eating in the team room and, and we're all together. You know, we're all sitting watching the game together. We're all playing ping pong. We're we're signing the million flags together that we have to sign. We're doing all these things that um, we, ju we just don't have those opportunities in individual events. You know, everyone has their own schedule. They're practice playing at different times, arriving at different times. And, um, you know, it's when we get together in, in normal events, you know, we, we have that same relationship. It's just we're not all of us are together at one time. The, the opportunity just doesn't present itself. And, um, yeah, we are. I mean, it's uh, – Obviously, it's it's not like all 12 of us are just sitting, you know, cross-legged around a circle on the floor just talking about life. But it's we're, we're all in our just kind of bopping around the room and, and catching up here and there. And it's uh, it's been fun. Thanks. Phil? Yeah. Hi, Justin. You're obviously having to wear the Ralph Ren U.S. team uniform this mm -hmm. week. Just wondering how was that sort of handled in the background? Were there any problems, any discussions? Um, and is there any kind of distraction for you at all this week? Uh, my uh, my priorities are a lot more than the clothes that I'm wearing this week. It's about trying to get a point for Team USA and and earn as many as I can. And no, it was uh, it was never even discussed until just now. Let's go over to, let's go over to number seven. Hey Justin, knowing you're close with Tiger, uh, Stricker's made it clear that even though he's not here, he's he's still a part of the team. Just curious if if you've spoken to him and and what his message has been for for you guys this week. Yeah, I mean I got together with him a couple of times last week, and uh, I mean more so just. You know, going over, see how he's doing as a friend more than uh, as a vice captain or if he's even still considered that. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he's 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 so into it. He obviously wants the best for our team. He wants the best for all of us. And um, it means a lot to him. I think people would be surprised. I mean, they obviously saw it and y'all saw it in Australia, how much it meant to him. But uh, just the amount of work and the amount of hours he's willing to spend to make sure that he feels like the team is is prepared and um is as ready to go as possible is is pretty cool um but at the end of the day he also understands that you know we're 12 of the best players in the world and and we know how to play golf and uh sometimes less is more so i think he he's great at balancing that out but it was um it was more i'm here if you need me kind of thing number nine back right for you hey jt i'm just curious what do you think of the qualities that make for a good Ryder cup teammate or playing partner it's a good question. I think, I mean, the format's very dependent. It's, you know, four balls, um, obviously a lot easier. You're playing your own ball. You, you, I mean, realistically don't even have to talk to your partner. You just kind of do your own thing and it's a lot easier to get in a rhythm, but you know, foursomes, I think it's pretty important to put two uh, personalities together, two friends together, two guys that get along, maybe their games complement each other. Um, but it's just, I mean, for me, at least what I've noticed is, I mean, I've been fortunate to play, um, you know, my record is obviously has been good in team events, but you look at my partners in, in Jordan, Ricky, and Tiger, uh, I mean, I've been very fortunate to have some really good partners, and that's that's like the number one rule that caddies will tell you of having a good caddy career is have a good player. And it's uh, it's just one of those things. I mean, we have such a deep, good team that um, it's not like anybody is a weak link on our team, and it's just about getting the um, the energy similar I would say and, and two guys that want to play together two guys that want to go to battle out there for each other that would take a bullet for each other and I think we have a team team room that's full of that and I think that's what makes it uh makes it exciting for these pairings because there's so many options let's go to 26 please Dan hey Justin uh the Ryder Cup could have likely been played last year but that would have meant without fans what does it mean to have the fans here this week and what role do they play in this event um uh, they play a huge role like I said I haven't experienced one on U.S. soil, but I'm very excited to, and okay. I think all of us uh, partook in a little bit of a, I guess, a, a, a poll last year on how we would want, if the Ryder Cup was to happen, how we would want it. Would it be with 
you know, would we rather play it with no fans? Would you rather play it with half fans or just or just cancel it? And my number one answer was play it with full fans or, or nothing else. And um, I mean, for it's a it's a huge advantage to play in front of your your home crowd. And it's also it makes the event so special. I mean, it would have been um, it would have been a shame to to play this without fans or even with very very limited fans. Uh, I mean, this is this is one of the biggest sporting events in the in the world, and it's a huge deal for the for the PGA. It's a big deal for us, and um, you know I think it, it, they did they did the right thing in pushing it back here to make sure that not only us players but everybody could experience this uh, for what it's worth. Twenty three. Uh, Justin, uh, how stoked are you to potentially again you know reunite with uh, you know. Jordan in a in a pairing, and if something were to prompt Captain Stricker to have to break that up, would you be receptive to that idea? I'm receptive for whatever is best for the team. Um, I if it means that Jordan and I play every match together, if it means that we split up, um, I'm everybody is on board with what is best for the team, and I think that's what is most important. You know, you're gonna. That's the thing is. Yeah, on paper, it's pretty easy to just kind of put matches out and you got, all right, we got these teams, we got these four teams, we got these four teams, but things change. You know, guys, maybe something happens, they maybe tweak something or they just aren't playing good or they're they're tired or, or just one guy wants to go or whatever it might be. I mean, things change, and I think that's something that, that Strick has the ability to do and he's such a great captain that he's able to adapt on the run. But I, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to play with Jordan because he's um, – Obviously, a great buddy of mine, and we and we get along so well. But I think we understand each other's games well enough to where we we know when we're needed, when we're not needed, and um, and pretty much just stay out of each other's way because we're both you know pretty good players, and um, and hopefully can uh, can go get some points for us this week. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up here at number five. Uh, you mentioned how nervous and how nerve wracking that first tee can be. I'm curious, like when the nerves hit you? Is it does it hit you when you reach the tee? When you're walking to the tee, when you're warming up, when does it actually arrive? For me, it was walking to the tee. I, I mean, France had a, just a, an absolutely absurd setup there on the first tee, and there was a pretty big bridge, I think, that kind of went from the chipping green that would go over, that would come kind of right down to the left of the first tee and walk on. And, and I mean, Jordan was great with me because it being my first match and him playing a couple, um, he'd been in my shoes before, and he probably knew the things I was feeling. And... I, I I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday. We were walking across the bridge, and it was four ball the first match. And we talked about – I mean, four ball is pretty kind of lenient on who goes first, who doesn't. But he was just like, do you want to go first or me? And I just was like, I'm going. And he's like, you got it. You know, he, he understood that. And he's like, it, you need to do what you're comfortable in in this moment. And he knew it was going to take a couple holes for me to settle in. And, you know, I rode my horse till I finally got comfortable. But it's – um it is. It's it's a bizarre feeling. It's hard to explain, but I'm I'm pretty excited to experience it again in a couple of days. Justin, thanks for spending some time with us. Uh, enjoy your day here. Thanks. Jordan Spieth, thank you, sir, for coming and spending some time with us. Welcome to your fourth career Ryder Cup. Um, um, it's been since 2015. You 17 under par, runner up. What are your recollections of that week and? Uh, did that give you comfort as you prepared to, to come here and represent the United States again? You know, it was, I was riding a nice momentum wave at that point in time, and um, everything was going right. I remember, uh, you know, this 18th green is pretty special to me. I remember holding a bunker shot, maybe my ninth hole Friday, um, you know, foot kind of outside the bunker, like a tough little shot. And then, uh, and then on the 72nd hole, that was, you know, I didn't, didn't accomplish what I set out to that day. It was difficult starting behind in the way Jason played, but um, I I became world number one on that green, so uh, that was a lifelong dream of mine. So a very special, you know, place that I'll, I'll always remember that moment. Um, I wasn't fully aware of it at the time. I'm pretty sure that was it was going to happen, and then I was told I think and it was here, it was right over there, wherever the interview station was that 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 that, that was the case. So. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I love the golf course, the setup of it. It's beautiful. It's on the lake, but uh, you got to control the ball in the wind. Uh, you got to hit kind of different shots off tees, um, and then if you position the ball well, you know you, you have these green complexes that are kind of there's not a ton of slope, but they're subtle, so you can actually feed the ball into whole locations. It should be a really exciting match play course because uh, you can get into trouble, but 
you can also birdie just about every single hole with the right shot. So um, it's tough and fair. Uh, and then if we see it in some colder, windier conditions, it could be um, you know, a unique test as well. So excited to be back here. Um, I've said it before, if it were held last year, I, I'm not sure if I you know, would have been on that team. And um, so I felt like I lucked out a little bit um, in that situation. But, uh, you know, been pretty aware that I was going to be here for the last month or so. Um, you know, felt pretty good after the Open Championship of my chances. And, and that was a huge goal of mine for this season and um, a lofty one starting the year out. So i uh, just excited to get back out and experience the Ryder Cup again. All right, let's hit the floor here. Start with Doug, number 20. Jordan, you and, and Patrick have been the most frequent partnership in a Ryder Cup. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but does that surprise you? Um, and is that possibly one of the maybe problems that, is, uh, that, that have affected the U.S., that there hasn't been over all the years more frequent partnerships finding a, a recipe and sticking with it? I'd have thought maybe Bubba and Webb, but, um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I don't necessarily think so. I think especially with this team, with the amount of, um, you know, first-time Ryder Cup players, it's hard to call guys rookies here given the experience they have in, on the world's biggest stage in golf. So I, I don't really like using that term for these guys. But uh, it's, it's a wave where, you know, I was talking with Justin about it. We've known everyone on this team since grade school except for Dustin and Tony. And, uh, I mean, that's it's pretty special. Um, so you have a camaraderie. It's kind of more of like a really light setting. We've known, you know, guys have known each other for a long time. And... Um, so I think that that statistic, to answer your question, will probably start to um, start to not be the case going forward. I think uh, you'll start to see some pairings that guys find a lot of success in and continue for a number of years, given the average age and um, and the, the caliber of players that are on this team. Thanks. Go across to number four, Mark. Hey, hey, Bill Jordan. Um, I just, uh, with regard to Lee Westwood and Sergio, uh, two of their veterans, what's your level of respect for what these guys have done over these over the long amount of time in this competition? You, you being here with your fourth, and these guys are, you know, having played so many. I'm just kind of curious what your level of respect is for what they've done. Yeah, I don't, I don't know their stats. Obviously, they've won nine of the last 12 Ryder Cups, but I don't know individually. Clearly, they've had a lot of success, but. First off, to be able to play on the amount of teams they have year in and year out shows the consistency of high-level play that that they're able to um, have. And then um, I played Sergio in 2016 in a match with Patrick versus Sergio and Rafa, and it was a good alternate shot match. Went back and forth, and we had a lead that squandered. And then Patrick made a nice four-footer to tie, five-footer to tie the match on the 18th. So it was a good match. Um, they're, they're just really good players, and they, they very much are very proud of, of where they come from. And it shows in this event um, via what I've seen on TV prior to playing and then you know playing against them on team. So the fact that they've both been playing the caliber of golf they've been playing this year to make this team with the experience they have makes them very dangerous. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, there's – you step on the first tee and you know you're going to play two of the best players in the world, play against two of the best players in the world regardless. And on Sunday, you know, a match against one of the best players in the world with a little, they have extra incentive, we have extra incentive. So um, it's, it's probably very helpful for them to have them playing really well and the experience, but I'm pretty excited about the idea that we've got youth and, and um, fire kind of on with the guys in, in our locker room. Let's go 13 and then 7. 13. Rex? Jordan, way back here. I know you don't like to use the term or refer to them as rookies on the team, but if any of them did come up to you this week and ask you to kind of explain the atmosphere on the first tee or how to handle that pressure, I guess, what would you tell them? Well, I've I Cardi kind of have to a couple of the guys. Um, and I've asked some of the assistants and, and even some of the other players just so that I was kind of on the same page. But I asked them kind of what it feels like to in the middle of a match, you know, to them. What do you compare it to? And m most everybody has said it, it feels like you're in contention in a big tournament or a major championship, you know, each match. And to, 
I, I, so what I would say is one, it's more of the adrenaline rush than the nerves. Like it's more of an exciting version of that than it is a nervy version of that. Um, and embrace that because, you know, you don't really get that opportunity. Um, but once every, you know, couple years and then two, you know, given that you get a, you get to learn a lot from this event, you learn what you do well. Um, but then like this tournament has propelled me into really good seasons the next seasons after I've played, um, given you get that kind of experience all, uh, I mean, how many, you know, maybe it takes two or three years if you're playing really well to have four or five times you're in contention at a major, but you get to do it, you know, three, four or five times this week. Um, so embrace that, uh, you know, and again, it's more of an adrenaline rush. Uh, than it is a nervy feeling, but that's what it's compared to, in my opinion. Seven? Yeah. Granted, we're playing next to a lake and, and not an ocean, and the rough won't be super long this week, but you know, visually, there are some similarities between this and some courses overseas. And I'm just curious, you mentioned having to flight it in the wind and kind of using some slopes. Where do you put this course on the sort of continuum from, I don't know if Hazeltine or Valhalla is, is one end of the spectrum and like a proper, you know, like an open championship? Layout is the other. Where, where does it rank? Yeah, it's it's an American Lynx, isn't it? Um, it it's it's played from the air though. Uh, it's you're not bouncing balls up to these greens. Um, it's played from the air, but you also have to you, know, you also have to hit shots um, versus driving range shots. Um, you have uneven lies that you have to work maybe against them or with them. Hold winds, ride winds. Uh, so it's I think it's an American Lynx. I don't think that uh, I think that. I mean, we had we had Americans finish one two at the Open Championship this year. I, you know, I don't really think that it makes that much of a difference um, on the 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 style of course. I think, you know, our team, uh, our uh, captains and or Strick and the vice captains are trying to you know figure out ways that maybe fit the players specifically on our team um, as far as rough cuts and fairway cuts where they are and green speeds and firmness and that kind of stuff, but. You know, it's an aerial link, so it's you still have to hit, play very similar golf to what we experience on the PGA Tour um, for the most part. Back here, number 25. Jordan, what benefit, if any, do you think the, t the whole team coming here ahead of time, what, what was the benefit of that? And secondly, who's the best ping pong player on this team? I was curious ahead of time, to be honest, um, you know, about – you know, how it would be, and I thought it was extremely beneficial. Um, I thought the commitment of guys to get up here was cool. Uh, and then it was very light. We were messing around. We were, you know, we were hitting shots. We weren't really, like, chipping and putting to all the pins. It was more let's have some fun and play a match with each other um, and just kind of see, you know, get our feet on the ground, see the grandstand, see the setting ahead of time so that when we, when we arrive today, um, you know, you're not kind of taken back. You've already been here. Feels just a just a you know that little bit more comfortable. Um, I don't. I we haven't. You know, we've only been here one night. I think everybody was kind of getting settled. I think Bryson and uh, uh, Berger were the only two that played, and I think Berger bested Bryson. Bryson. I don't know how it ended up for the night, but I think he got him at least the first two matches. All right, we have room for a couple more. Uh, number eight. Jordan over here. Sorry. There, hey, um, the last few times uh, Stricker has spoken to the media, he's hit the point that his goal is to out-prepare. Uh, preparation, preparation, that seems to be the key word. He is your fourth captain. Have you been impressed with that element of his captaincy? And have you, do you feel that what he's saying is what he's doing in terms of this hardcore preparation? Yeah, it sure, sure seems that way at this point. Yeah, I mean, for again, for having one practice session and being here, half a day. I did a couple hours. Some of us came out here for a little bit yesterday. Uh, for them, for every meeting that we've had and everything we've talked about, it seems, wow, these guys, you know, we didn't even need to have a practice round and, and they've got a lot of a lot of it figured out. So, um, you know, I think it's a, Strick would tell you it's a team effort with his vice captains and there's a lot of experience on that board for us. And, um, you know, so we're, we go out there and try and hit the shots, and wherever they put us, and how often they put us there, you know, we're we're trusting in them that it's it's at our best interest. But they're also very open to this team to voicing their opinion to them. Um, there there there's no, you know, ego um, with Strick. He's very much, 
he'll listen to anybody about anything if you're comfortable in a setting, if you're not. And I think he's made that, he's made the rest of the team feel that way ahead of time. So certainly I think things can adjust, but as far as the, how prepared you can be on Tuesday for a Friday start, uh, I would say it's probably the most that, that I've seen in the four cups. Okay, we're going to put a wrap on it with number nine. Back right again. Um, being one of the guys who have done this a few times, what are your general feelings on having a set plan? You're playing this time with this person. Here's kind of mapping it out um, versus deviating from that or, or adjusting on the fly. How do you kind of feel about those things? I've not been in a setting where it's there's been an adjust on the fly, so I'm not maybe the right person to ask that question to. I've I've started in the same pairing. I've finished in each of the cups. Uh, certainly, there's adjustments to be made. I think there's you know that that's hard for me to speak to. That's that's really what the captains and the vice captains' job is. Is you know where do we react and where do we you know keep our game plan. Um, and, and uh, I, you know, so it's hard, again, for me, I've, I've just assumed I'm going to go out, try and win that first point and roll from there. Um, and it's, it's worked the last few, and, and um, I don't see why that should change from my point of view. And I think it's really just that's more of how they can speak to it. But I, I've not, a President's Cup, so I've, you know, mixed and matched throughout a tournament, but um, not in a Ryder Cup. Be comfortable if it was you know in between matches whatever we're, we're gonna we're gonna switch things up on the original plan and, and do do this. Sure, I'd, I'd, I'd figure them. they've you know while we were playing they had they have a reason for it and you know whether it's statistics to back it up or it's um, you know feel off of watching what's been going down because you only know what's going down in your group. So uh, yeah, I mean you're you got to be prepared to play them all, but you know expect to to be. Um, watching as well and, and trusting they want people rested for Sunday. So, uh, you know, we know the Euros typically have a different strategy. They're, they're going to play probably four or five guys, five matches regardless, and some of the other guys will probably play, you know, two or three. Um, and you expect to see the, the same guys out that we've seen for a number of years now five times, and um, that's probably we, – we've got a lot of depth and. Uh, well, both teams have a lot of depth, but I think we're going to rely on the youth and our depth um, to potentially, uh, you know, strategize a bit. Jordan, thanks for your time. Thanks. Enjoy your day. We are pleased to be joined by Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, Bryson, welcome to your second Ryder Cup. Um, you've represented your country twice previously, once in the President's Cup and once in our Ryder Cup in Paris. Uh, this will be your first, uh, let's say, home match. Um, how much are you looking forward to being out there uh, with uh, the, the, the majority of fans that are on your side this time? Oh, it's going to be fun. I mean, every team event I've played in, it's been out of the States. So being here for the first time, I guess you could say, is uh, an exciting opportunity. It's going to be fun to see what uh, we can do and roll up the crowd in the right way and get us uh, behind our backs and moving us in the, in the direction that we all want to be in, which is taking home that cup. All right, let's hit the floor for some questions here for Bryson. There was a number oh, 20. Oh, Doug. Sorry, I wait to get called on there. Sorry. There, there was a Bryson story in, in one of the magazines about you wrecking your hands as you're yeah. getting ready for the long drive, and I think it led to a perception how much you're concentrating on, on this or the other. How did the two mesh? And, yeah. and uh, did anyone ever question the idea of doing this right after a Ryder Cup? So when I had had some blisters on my hands and, you know, wrecked my hands. That was before the FedEx Cup playoffs. That was that Friday before that is when it happened. And the story came out later after um, – after, because I was talking about it and how badly my hands hurt after that because of just how, how much effort I was putting into it. And I played pretty well during the FedEx Cup playoffs. Um, you know, I just wished my putting and wedging was a little bit better. And leading up into this event, uh, I've put full fo force focus into this event. And I think part of hitting it far is – uh, some of why I'm so successful and how I could utilize my length on this golf course to potential advantage. Um, as well as, you know, I, I've been working on my wedging and putting nonstop as well. Um, thinking about how to roll it better, thinking about how to control my distances better with this new speed. So it's, it's definitely a delicate balance, but one that I'm, you know, strictly advised pretty well on to do my absolute best in the Ryder Cup. Speed right now compared with, let's say, middle of the season. It's many faster. Of the time. It's definitely faster. I would say <laughs> hopefully I can get out on the golf course 200 mile, mile an hour ball speed with a 45 inch driver. That'd be really nice. Um, 
again, there's going to be certain holes that's a huge advantage on. 10, 6, 5, 1, 2, uh, you name it. There's, there's a whole list of holes where it's going to be a huge advantage, I hope, uh, if I'm hitting in the fairway. All right. Back right, number 7. Another sort of long drive question. You, you, okay. told, you, you've told us about how you've been hesitant to like fully let it rip in a PGA Tour event just mm -hmm. because stroke play. You've got to, well, with match right. play, where if you hit a bad one, it's just one hole. Do you, do you think you'll you'll do the kind of wind up hole thing this week? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly opportunities where that potentially could happen. If you watched uh, the match with Phil, Tom Brady, Aaron, and I, there's a couple holes where I got an extra shot and I was able to go at it. Um, and I got to like 204 ball speed on that, which was really cool. So hopefully it's a little colder here, uh, but hopefully I can get over 200 mile an hour. That'd be pretty sweet to see if, if they have those on uh, those stats out there this week. All right, let's go over to number six. Again on the right. Yeah, Bryson, this is the, the first time you've talked to kind of the, the open print media in a, yeah. a little while. And I was just wondering, you know, what has gone into that calculation and, and that decision making from your end? I think this is a team event. I'm focused on helping Team USA to a victory, and that's honestly the reason why I'm here. All right, let's go to Steve on 22 over here on your left. Preston, how important was the uh, reconnaissance trip here, and uh, yeah. what happened yeah. between you and Berger last night? <laughs> nice. Way to go, Daniel, whoever leaked that. Um, no, I, it, it was okay. Going back to the reconnaissance, it was, it was a lot of fun seeing the team here, a lot of camaraderie. We, uh, came together, I think, as a team really nicely during those two days. And coming here this week, it felt like we we're prepared already. We we're like ready to go already, which is cool. Um, that is something that we don't get very often, I think, in Ryder Cups, going and practicing early. So just having that comfort level, that extra level of comfort of knowing the golf course already, not feeling like I have to go practice and play every day and feeling rested going into this uh, on Friday is going to be really nice. And then, yeah. Um, I lost in ping pong, which kind of stinks uh, to Daniel. He he beat me. Uh, you know, there are obvious excuses I could make, but I won't. Uh, so I'm pretty sour about it. I'm going to get him back. All right, we're going to go to Michael on three. There you go. Yo. Um, foursome's an alternate shot. You know, your style of play in in on the outside looking in, a lot of people say you would only be a great four ball player. Yeah. If you were going to sell yourself for foursomes, how would you do that? And are you expecting or hoping to play in foursomes and alternate shot? Well, I'd say first off, I feel like I'm a player that can adapt to anything um, if, if I have to. And I feel like there are certain players on our team that can mesh really, really well with my game. And you guys could probably figure that out. Uh, but there are certain players that, that will be uh, – a nice fit to the puzzle, if you would like to say that. And I could comfortably say that I have no issue playing either format. Uh, I think best ball has its benefits to my style of play, and alternate shot with the right person can be pretty deadly. All right, Mark on four, I believe, four. Bryson, I'm just kind of curious, uh, with looking at the European side, uh, what's your impression of what some of the veterans like Lee Westwood and Sergio have done in this competition. I'm sure you're probably aware their yeah. records are pretty good and they've played a lot of them. Just Obviously, you just went up against Lee uh, yeah. early, in, you know, back in March. Uh, what, what's your level of respect for what those guys have done? Well, I have a tremendous level of respect uh, of the European team. They've obviously done incredible over the last couple decades, and we should not take it lightly. Uh, they know what to do, they know how to play, and they know how to grind it out. I think they may have a little bit more experience in match play situations growing up. I think they played it a little bit more. But again, as we look at it, we have a, an amazing team that has an opportunity to do something special here this week. Uh, the team that's, that's been um, put together is, is one of the best. And you know, going up against veterans like Sergio and Lee, uh, even Rory now, I would say he's, he's awesome. Um, it's going to be a difficult task, but one that I think with the crowd behind us and having the golf course the way it is, uh, it could, could, be, could definitely be done. Gary, over here on your left, number 24. Bryson, will you hit driver on 14 holes? And what are the landing areas like at 325 yards? Uh, I don't know if I'll hit driver on all 14 of them, depending on the wind. I think there are numerous amounts of holes that are super beneficial to me hitting driver. I think five is a great example if it's the right wind. Um, you know, I could 
pretty much go right at the flag, which is cool. Uh, it was here in the practice session. I had like 120 yards in to that green. Um, you know, where guys are going to be hitting it over the left maybe and having a three wood or hybrid in. Um, up near some of the landing areas, if I'm flying at 320, 330, it gets tight in certain areas. So I probably will be hitting three wood or hybrid off of certain holes depending on the wind for sure. Uh, number, where was it? Number eight. eight. Hey, Bryson. Uh, I've eight. followed you on the course a lot in the last month or so, and there's been times when I thought the fan behavior was particularly cruel. And again, it may only be 1% of fans or something sure. like that. But I wanted to ask you, you spent a lifetime, or a professional lifetime, playing in front of fans. So you probably have Betty better armor than most people would. But is there any part of you that feels hurt at what's happened lately? Um, I mean, no matter what, we're all humans at the end of the day. And I think there's obviously a level of, I guess you could say, control that any human will ever have. And you can have a lot of armor, and you can protect yourself with people around you and all that. Sure, there's, there's, there are times where it's not comfortable, um, but there's also times where it fuels me. And I think you know, this week's going to be an amazing example of it, and, and it's going to be fun to be able to get the crowd behind us and, and pump them up and show them what I can hopefully do and what we can do as a team more importantly, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to make this about me again. This is this is about a team event. Uh, I've got a, a brass chest. I've got taken a lot of heat, but I'm okay with it, and I understand I'm in the place where I'm at, and it's going to be that way um, moving forward. And I recognize, and all I'm going to do is my absolute best to show people who I truly am, and whatever people think about me is is not important. It's about the team this week. It's about riling us all up and getting that Ryder Cup back here on U.S. home soil. Back left, number 25. Bryson, have you made efforts to end the feud with Brooks? And if so, where, where has that gone? Um, you know, again, a lot of this social media stuff has definitely been driven by a lot of external factors, not necessarily us two. I mean, we had a great, we had some great conversations uh, tour championship week when we had dinner and then this week uh, as well. I had dinner, sat down, sat down at dinner with him last night, and it was fine. And I think there may be something fun coming up here um, moving forward, but I won't speak too much more on that. All right, number five. Hi, right. Bryson. Maybe related a little to the previous question there. The, you've got, a, as you know, a controversial reputation. Do you see this as an opportunity if things go well for you and your team to, to, to change the perception of you as a as a player and uh, as a person? Look, I'm not trying to change anybody's perception. All I'm trying to do is showcase what I can do for the game of golf. And whether people like it or not, that's their interpretation of it. Um, and so for me, again, I'm going to keep providing people with the best entertainment I possibly can. And, you know, some people may not like it. Some people love it. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm now doing stuff on TikTok and Instagram and uh, YouTube, just trying to do things a little different because I want to show people – you know, who I actually am. And I think it's cool when they get to see behind the scenes a little bit, see what I do during my daily life. It kind of opens it up to like, oh, whoa, this isn't just this person uh, because of what people think of me out on the golf course. This is somebody, it's an actual human being. Um, so I think at the end of the day, it's not about changing anybody's perception. Out here it's about getting the crowd behind us and allowing us to, uh, I guess you could say, rile us up to win the cup. But if you, um, if you deliver, <clears throat> excuse me, four or five points for the American team, do you expect you're going to get less of the grief that some fans have been giving you? Hey, look, if, I'm going to try and get as many points as I can, and I think that, yeah, that p potentially could change it for sure. Um, there's always going to be people that are saying things no matter what it is. You know, even if I, I do something, if I make a hole-in-one on every single hole out here, there's always going to be people saying something. So I'm not worried about it. I still love and respect them. I understand they have their opinions and whatnot, and I respect those opinions. I see their points of view. But for me, again, taking it back and looking back, this, is about, this isn't about me. This is about the team you know, going and winning the Ryder Cup. Thanks. Hey, we're we're going to wrap it up here with Jeff on 19. Hey, Scotty. <laughs> Can you come on up here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Come on. Br Bryce, I was going to ask you one about Scotty. You guys are going out in practice today. How, how far back do you <coughs> go with him as far as relationship-wise, and what are your thoughts on his game? Well, I'll say in college, um, you know, he was at Texas, and we, we played a little bit, didn't we, Scotty? Just a, just a few events, a lot, a lot of amateur tournaments. And uh, a lot of US amateurs, and we never really, you know, I guess you say practiced a lot together or whatnot, but we always knew how good each other were. You know, we, we always worked hard, and 
I saw his game. It was unbelievable. Um, growing up, he won the U.S. Junior Amateur. I saw that, and it's just like, man, this kid's a stud. And uh, as time has gone on, he's just gotten better and better and better. And his wedge game and putting is, is incredible. It's with the best of them, and his long iron, iron game is incredible and um, is driving solid, too. He's an all-around player, and I expect nothing but the best from him in future years. He's going to win a lot of tournaments, and it's going to be fun to watch him see what he can do out on tour. Bryson, thanks for finding us. Uh, enjoy thanks. your day. Here Thank you. Whistling Straits. We are joined by Scotty Scheffler. Scotty, welcome to your first career Ryder Cup. Um, it's been two weeks since you were named to this team, give or take. Uh, is that enough time for it to sink in? And um, what did you use in those two weeks? Uh, what did you really prepare on to be here both mentally and, and on the golf course? Yeah, I would say to prepare mentally, I, I took a few days off after the playoffs and the, the long season that we had. I was a little bit worn out, so I had to take a little bit of time. But um, it was nice getting that phone call and – having some good motivation to go out and practice again. Um, my year didn't finish off how I hoped that it would. And so to have an, op have an opportunity to come here, represent our country, and, and play well is, is really exciting. And, I mean, I just prepared like I would any other major golf tournament. Nothing crazy, just my usual prep. Okay, let's hit the floor. Mark, number four. Hey, Scotty. I'm just curious, with Bryson just here a minute ago, obviously you know he's been a bit of a polarizing figure out here. And you you – You've known him longer than some of the guys on the team. What's your impression of how he's been treated, kind of, you know, publicly on the outside and the perceptions that are out there? And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the perceptions around him, it's, it's whatever, you know, the public creates. I think everybody has an opinion on him. I have an opinion on him as well. I mean, I think he's a fantastic guy. Like we said, I, I've known him since college. Um, he's always been nothing but gracious and kind to me and um, – he means really well. I, I think sometimes people take little tidbits of what he says and try and beat him down a little bit, and I think that's kind of what happens in sports is people get built up and then they get torn down once they reach the top. And, you know, I think it's it's something you've seen for a long time. It's something you saw. Like, I watched The Last Dance. I've watched The Last Dance a couple of times, and it's something you saw with Jordan as well. And when people make it really big like Bryson has, I think some people try and tear him down a little bit. But, I mean, he's a fantastic guy. He's got a great heart, and, I mean, I really have nothing but good things to say about him. Uh, number 25, back left. Scotty, Jordan made the point that there really aren't rookies on the U Team USA because of all the experience winning Olympics and, and playing another team competition. You are the true, real rookie. Uh, what advice have you been getting from your teammates and, and maybe other, other people uh, ahead of this event? Um. I mean, the, the vice captains and Steve have been really helpful as well as just the guys on the team. I, am, I would say I am the only true rookie having not played a President's Cup before, but I don't feel like that. Um, I feel like I belong on this team. The guys have done a really great job of making me feel like I belong. I think if I was showed up on this team and either didn't have friends or the guys weren't being nice to me, it would feel a lot different. But I feel like it's been a seamless transition for me being on this team. The guys have been nothing but kind. and. Um, I think also that the top six or the guys who knew they were going to be on the team had a lot of um, input in the selection process. It wasn't just the PGA of America or Steve making the call. It was the guys on the team. And so for me, just having their kind of vote of confidence for me is fantastic. And, you know, I, I feel a part of the team. Doug, number 20. I was going to, uh, Scotty, ask, just ask you uh, in terms of getting together with team for the first time, how, how is the uh, experience different here than it was at the Walker Cup in terms of fitting in and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think at the Walker Cup it was different because we were all the same age. Like here there's a little bit of an age gap, but and here the wives and the girlfriends are really involved, which I think is fun. Um, at the Walker Cup it was really just the 10 guy, I think it was a 10 guy team. It was really just us and the captain, and that was pretty much it in the team room. And so it was a little different environment. Here there's a little bit more going on, but I think with everybody's wives being there, it's, it's very comfortable for everybody just to be in the team room, hanging out, wives, girlfriends, all getting to know each other, um, as well as, you know, I would say that's probably better. The wives and girlfriends get to know each other because they don't see each other on a daily basis like we do. You know, I've seen these 12 or 11 guys at the same events for the past two years. So I know all of them pretty well, but our wives don't necessarily know each other. Was there, was there ever a concern uh, of you about fitting in? Not a concern, but were you kind of curious how that would 
how that would uh, take place? Uh, fitting in, not really. Um, yeah, not really, I guess. <laughs> good answer. Well, yeah. I, like, I like short answers. Yeah, yeah, I don't great. really have anything else to say on that. <laughs> right over here, number eight. Uh, Scotty, you're incredibly even keeled, so I'm trying in my head to imagine what it looks like when you get really excited. So if you can go back to the moment when you figured out that you'd be a captain's pick, was it, I mean, was there an expression of joy? Did you feel joy? What was, what was that like? Yeah, I think it's funny people say that I'm not emotional because my wife would say the complete opposite. I mean, I, I cry a decent amount. I'm actually a pretty emotional guy. And so um, for me, when I got the call, it was pretty similar. I was just waiting at home with the phone basically the entire day. One of my best friends from high school came over. We were catching up and just chilling, and then the phone rang, and I was like, I'm sorry, buddy, I have to take this phone call. <laughs> um, and then Steve made it really quick. He said, hey, do you want to be a part of the team? I was like, yeah, sure, Steve, if you need me, it's fine. I'll be part of the team. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, a few tears of joy. My wife was really happy. She knows how hard I've worked for this. Um, it, was, it was a really cool moment. Went and told Randy and my parents. And, I mean, it was, I was probably just as emotional getting that phone call as I was the Walker Cup as well. Um, I remember the one for the Walker Cup. I was on the range with Randy. And I didn't know when that phone call was going to come in. Steve basically told us, he's like, hey, Monday, be at your phone. And I was like, okay, be at my phone. For the Walker Cup, it was a little bit different. Um, and that was emotional as well. What's the last movie that made you cry? The last movie that made me cry? I'm trying to think. Or I guess any movie that has made you cry, if you can't remember the last one. Um, I don't know, probably because it's fresh on my mind. Miracle usually gets me going. Yeah. Um, also, just some of the just silly shows that we watch. Like, I think Meredith and I both cried at the end of Stranger Things. I think that was – we just finished a season of that. Um, but I think, yeah, those two. Thank you. <laughs> I believe number seven, right? Yep. Yeah. Speaking of Steve's decision to pick you, he made it clear that one of the reasons was that uh, analytically and statistically you fit this golf course really well. It's clear that he's using statistics and analytics a lot. I'm just curious, like – do you do that on a weekly basis? And, and what's your sense of how the team kind of accepts that kind of data and information? Yeah, I would say there's been a pretty open line of communication between us and Steve on where the guys want to play, where that also fits with the statistics. And I think a lot of the guys out here, the guys that are on the team are all really smart. And um, I think a lot of times the statistics that we use is kind of a, a backup's not the right word, but kind of a second opinion. Because like if the statistics guys are going to tell us what holes we should play the evens and odds. Like, that's something that, you know, if, I don't know, if Jordan and Dustin are going to go out together, it's going to be pretty easy for them to figure out as well. And so those statistics guys, it's, it's really kind of that second level of confidence that this is the right decision, if that makes sense. Over here on your left, number 19. Scott, I'm sure you've heard and will hear a lot of first tee stories. What are your own expectations of what that scene's going to be like? And secondly, what's your experience with foursomes? Um, so first tee experience, I'll go with that first. Um, it's going to be loud. And then the one thing I heard it was it's weird how loud it gets to how quiet it gets when you're about to hit the shot just because it's going to go back to a regular golf tournament when you're over the ball. And so I think that's going to be kind of a weird adjustment. I think it was Zach who told me that. Zach is like, it's just really weird how quiet it gets because it's so loud. And then all of a sudden it's dead silent. Um, so that's that. And then foursomes. I've played foursomes. I played it in junior golf on Wyndham Cup teams. I played like in four or five of those. I always loved alternate shot. Um, played it in the Walker Cup. And then we played a bit of it last week, and I'm sure I'm going to play a little bit more of it this week. Um, that's another thing that they're using heavy statistics on is who pairs well in what format. And so, um, I don't know, I like the format. If I get a chance to play, I'm, I'll enjoy it. If I don't, then that's OK, too. Um, Okay, straight back on your left, uh, 23. Uh, Scotty, what did you get out of the uh, visit here last week, and uh, what do you hope to get out of the next three days, especially today playing with the three guys you are in terms of preparation and knowledge and just feeling comfortable here? Yeah, I mean, Jordan, JT, and Bryson, they're great to bounce things off of. Um, played a lot of rounds with Jordan at home last week. I think you know, we're both enjoying kind of getting prepared for this tournament you know, in more of a team atmosphere than it is preparing for a U.S. Open or whatever tournament it is. It's, that's usually a little bit more individualistic. And 
Yeah, I mean, the prep weeks, it's going to be the same as it is any other major, just getting to know the golf course. The only difference is just trying to figure out who we're going to partner up with. Um, I think our captains have a really good idea of what the, our groupings are going to be. And so for us, I don't think there's going to be too much figuring out at the beginning of the week. I think they got a good idea of what we need to do and it's just a matter of going out there and doing it. Captain, thank you for finding us again. Um, one complete day of practice in. Um, what are you seeing out on that golf course? A little cooler temperatures, but uh, you know, is it just nice to get your team kind of in a groove um, as you start to work your way collectively as a team toward Friday and through the weekend? Yeah, very much so. Uh, and we took advantage of this day of you know the weather forecast looks for some heavier winds the next two days, so we felt like it was an important time to get out there and play. 18 holes, get these guys uh, some holes under their belt and get them out here. They're excited to be out here. They're enthused. They're ready to go. And um, so it was a great day. The weather turned out great at the end, and we had a great time out there. Terrific. Let's hit the floor for some questions. I guess we'll start over with number five. five. I believe. Hey, Steve, uh, this is just a nuts and bolts question, but can you go Monday through Thursday? And just let us know what the obligations are at night for the team, whether it's events they have to go to, dinners, things that are a, a must. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have a dinner with each other every night. I mean, we were in our hotel room or our uh, team room at the hotel, just the team. Um, tonight we have a dinner with just the team um, locally here, not too far away. Uh, very casual, uh, kind of, I don't, enjoy getting dressed up and getting all, uh, or Nikki for that matter, you know, she, <laughs> she's uh, very casual and, and I'm very casual. So we're trying to bring this attitude of, of uh, relaxed and, and uh, having a good time and being very casual. Uh, we're hopefully, hopefully rubbing off on the team that we're just here to have a fun, good time. And, and uh, but dinners every night, being together with each other, just uh, building those relationships. Um, Guys are enjoying themselves with each other. It's it's been great in the team room, um, and like I said, it's it, it's kind of translated out onto the golf course. To tell you the truth, they they had a ball today. It looked like they were, you know, goofing around and having fun with one another, and uh, and that's no different when we get back to the team room. Although, um, have you made it a uh, priority to reduce those sort of obligations that are outside the team? Has COVID been? Cut those out. How has that worked? A little bit of both. Yeah. Um, my goal coming in there was to kind of cut some of that out, and then COVID's kind of helped us do that, you know. And and we're we're doing the sensible things. We're doing the proper things to stay safe and within our team zone and within that bubble, and just trying to make sure that no one gets sick. I mean, we want to play. We don't want anything to uh, to jeopardize the health of any of our players or captains. And uh, so we're. We're cognizant of that. We're paying attention to that, and, and we're trying to do the right things. Thank you. All right, let's go over here on your left, Captain 21. Jeff. Steve, this can be a really demanding golf course when you have to post a score. I'm curious, in a match play format, do you see it in your players, like a different mindset, a different aggressiveness on how you can attack in spots here? You know, I think they're developing the game plan, you know, last week when we were here, and then obviously today they're going around um, you know, it's situational for each player. They, each guy's a little bit different. Um, you know, some guys like to attack. Some guys are pretty strategic and, and lay back, uh, kind of whatever they feel comfortable. You know, for one guy, uh, he may be comfortable with one thing, and that other guy may be uncomfortable with the same shot, you know. So to each his own kind of thing. And, um, yeah, so they're developing that as they're going around and, um you know, I guess it's situational, too. I mean, the guys will see how they're playing, see how they're feeling. Each shot is a little bit different. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's fun to watch them. I know that. When I was going around there today, it's to hear that sound. You don't hear that sound on the Champions Tour, the sound of them hitting the ball like they do. And it's, it's pretty impressive, these guys, how far they hit it and how solid they hit it. And uh, they're really good. Let's go over to number six. Rex, please. I mean, no specifics, obviously, but how set in your – game plan as far as pairings were you coming into this week and what are the chances that that might change over the next two days of practice I was pretty set you know uh in my mind always some questions whether it's the right thing or not I, I've done a lot of homework um 
talked to my assistant captains a bunch, talked to the players a bunch. Um, you know, everything looks really good on paper at times, but then you're like, oh, you know, what if something happens kind of thing. You always got to be prepared for the what ifs. Uh, so that's what we're doing as well. Um, but yeah, we've had a pretty good game plan from a while back. And, um, you know, we're, we're putting that into play. We're putting that in place. All right, let's go to Gary, number three. Steve, uh, what was your first tee experience like at Valhalla? <clears throat> And uh, what's the best first tee story you've heard from the guys uh, who have experienced that? Um, yeah, it's, a, uh, it's an unbelievable experience, and it'll be no different here. I mean, just coming out onto the first tee today was, was a cool experience. Uh, and it'll be 10 times more electric come Friday. Um, yeah, it's just uh, they're, all, they're all a little bit different. I mean, Paris was unbelievable. That was like walking into a stadium. I mean, there were so many people around the first and 18 green there. Um, but it's just, uh, it's an, and it's a nerve-wracking one. I remember being very nervous, but really excited and amped up to get out there to play. Um, so you got to, you know, my suggestion to the guys and uh, what I've been telling them is that, you know, to, to go experience it if you're not, you know, if you're not playing that first morning is, if you want to go experience that, um, you know, it's, it's just a really cool atmosphere and nerve wracking, but one that you wait your entire life, uh, golfing life that is to, to experience. Captain, we're going to beam out to Art Strickland. <coughs> Art, go ahead, sir. You're with the captain. Yeah, Strick, uh, I know that you want to get your rookies off to a good start. Have you given some thought to playing Scotty Sheffler with a guy he might know well, like a Bryson or a, or a Jordan Spieth, uh, to get him going early since he hasn't been in this kind of atmosphere before? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I guess you're going to have to tune in on Friday to watch. Uh, I'm really not going to. Uh, going to pairings quite yet with anybody. You know, Friday at the opening ceremony would be a great time to, uh, to let you know. Okay, let's come back in the room here. <laughs> number seven over here. Uh, two, if you can. Uh, on, um, on Colin and Brooks, you know, when it comes to kind of evaluating them coming back from those injuries, how much do you weigh what they say, how they're feeling, and versus what you see right? and you how you Who kind of evaluate? Who was the first one you said? Uh, more comes back. Oh yeah, and, uh, and and Brooks. Yeah, how much do I weigh? What? How much do you weigh? Like what they tell you in terms of how they're feeling. If they say, oh, you know, I'm 100 percent versus you evaluating them and what you see. Oh yeah, no, I've I've talked to them both and and um, they've assured me that they're 100 percent and ready to go and they'll do whatever it takes to to play as many matches that we ask of them. So um, that's a no issues from either one of those guys. And you mentioned about trying to keep things light, especially at night, and maybe more casual, more relaxed, um, less pressure. Uh, is that something that you've maybe thought of in the past that maybe guys were a little wound too tight or maybe putting too much pressure on themselves? Well, you know, we're here. You know, some guys got in Sunday. Some guys got in Monday. I mean, we all want to play right now. I mean, it's it's about trying to temper that excitement and and energy and we still have three more days right of of uh getting ready and um so it's about you know give them giving them their space too you know i mean they all prepare a little bit differently i prepare differently than anybody else on that team and they you know everybody again to each of their own right they they have a way they're in a routine on a weekly basis they uh they're used to doing it one way so i i want to give them that opportunity to do it whatever which way uh, they need to do it, hopefully, to bring out their best golf. Michael, number eight. Thank you, John. Uh, Steve, when you when you talk to uh, P Patrick, uh, it's a torrent of words that you get from him. You've known him. <coughs> you get a lot of words from Patrick when you ask him something. You've known him a long time. I'm wondering if you can remember anything really memorable he's ever said to you. Um, I don't know if it's a specific time, but I've. Uh, had the pleasure of playing with him a number of times over the course of my career. Uh, I had a chipping contest. I remember him one year at Congressional. You know, just uh, just a wonderful man. He's he's a friend. Uh, got to know him somewhat through the course of my career. But just uh, 
a true um, gentleman, a true champion, uh, you know, a guy that I think has got an unbelievable mo amount of, <clears throat> of uh, talent, you know, and he's changed his swing and does some different things to improve his game. He's not afraid to do that. So just a really uh, wonderful guy and, and uh, neat guy to know. If I could just follow up on that, you know, the world's in a very topsy-turvy place right now. Did you think it was important for you two guys to come in here as the captains and do it with a lot of a certain level of, of grace and gentlemanliness? Um, I don't think we're, you know, doing it any different than than who we really are. You know, I mean, um, yeah, I think you're just seeing us. I mean, we're, you know, we're polite to one another. We're we're um, try to conduct ourselves and the the proper manner and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I mean, we're excited to be playing here in front of fans. I mean, let's be real. I mean, if we would have had this last year with no fans, I mean, it would have been a shame. Um, but we're, we have this opportunity, an unbelievable opportunity to, to play this in front of, you know, the fans of Wisconsin and around the world and around our country. So yeah, it, it's going to provide a lot of relief and, and get people away from thinking about COVID for a while and think about watching some great golf. Thank you, Steve. Front right, uh, number one. Steve, um, with all the talk about fan behavior this year, <clears throat> what are your concerns out there? And also, what do you think that the vibe is going to be specific to Wisconsin? And secondly, what defines people from Wisconsin? What do you, what do you think that and how would you like to see that defined in this Ryder Cup? Yeah, and, and we can go on past history here with the other PGA championships here, the U.S. Open at Aaron Hills down the road. You know, the, the sports fans of Wisconsin turn out in droves. They're very uh, – they'll be loud. They'll be pro-U.S., right, which we're hoping for. But we're also hoping they don't cross the line, you know, which we've seen at some other Ryder Cups throughout the years. But, yeah, I, ex I expect uh, – you know, good rowdy fans. It's going to be rowdy. It's going to be loud, especially the first tee uh, and pro USA, obviously. Um, so we're looking forward to that. We need that. We need that backing. You know, it, it is our home turf. So, uh, what defines what was the, defines Wisconsin, Wisconsin yeah, fans? Right. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of blue collar, hardworking people. You know, uh, salt of the earth people. Um, you know, I Midwest people are. You know, always seem to be. Uh, very nice and courteous, and yeah, I, I, um, I'm partial to that. I don't mean anything negative against any other part of the country, but you know, it's just great Midwestern folks. So you would think that this would feel differently a little bit from some other Ryder Cups. Well, we were up in Hazeltine not too long ago, and that that's you know that got loud and um, somewhat crossed the line at times, which we don't want to see. Um, so yeah, I I think it's gonna. You know, it's a Ryder Cup. These fans have been pent up for a long time, and they're going to come out and, and get behind their team. So it's, it's going to be loud, and we expect it to be loud. But, again, we ask for people not to cross that line, you know, and, and be respectful of both sides. Time for a couple more. Straight across, number four. Uh, Steve, a family question. I understand you're getting texts out there from your oldest daughter who was watching your youngest daughter win her first significant high school championship. Yeah. What does it mean to you that Izzy – was able to do something so special for her in a week that's uh, so special for all of you as a family. Yeah, very cool. You know, we're, you know, it's a golf, a golf family. We're excited. We're, we root each other on. We're, we're, you know, a part of each other's lives when it comes to golf. So pretty cool. Let's wrap it up here with Jeff right behind me, 20. Uh, Steve, you mentioned the, the wind. Uh, I'm over here. Sorry. The wind the next few days. Uh, you've been mon monitoring that. Um, is this golf course, is this a local knowledge um, golf course? And if so, um, what are you doing to feed information to players either regarding wind directions and things like that or just general uh, little bits and pieces of local knowledge? Um, you know, I think it's just I can't re really provide them too much of anything. You know, I think it's just experiencing that for themselves. You know, we were able to come here, like I said, last week and, we saw different wind conditions, different directions than we saw today. So we've been, we've seen, you know, three different days of wind directions. So I think sometimes all you can do is get out there and experience it and, 
and see those different conditions for yourself for yourself and develop your game plan and be prepared uh, in case that wind switches around, which it's supposed to. We've we know where it's supposed to come out of during the tournament, and um, it's not going to be that way the next couple of days. So, um, you know, these guys are probably doing a lot of homework at night with themselves, you know, thinking about the course and that different wind direction. And uh, they talk with their partners, potential partners, on game plans. And so it's uh, it'll be a challenge, you know, for guys that have not seen a particular wind that all of a sudden it's going to switch around. So, but they'll they'll do their homework. They're smart. They they do this for a living, and they'll be they'll be ready and prepared. Captain, thanks again for your time. Congratulations right. on the daughter's achievement. Yeah, thank and, you. Uh, have Appreciate a good night.